All right. Are you well, Rapscallion Queen? We're about to put uh, your masochism to the test. Okay. Uh, this is like the don't laugh challenge, but instead it's the don't cringe challenge, okay? Uh, whoever cringes, like, uh, last is the winner. And, uh, spoiler, none of you are going to last through this video without cringing, okay? And if you do, you're going to be- I, I, I think you need more help than I can give you. <laughs> there are people in the back of the room who have put m tape over their mouths as though they've been censored, as though they're not able to speak. So I just like to take the opportunity. <laughs> Nobody has stopped. Uh, wait. <laughs> I didn't expect it to go this hard in the first 10 seconds. I didn't expect it to go this hard. ...you from speaking. Nobody is... We're actually inviting you to speak. If anybody would like to come up and ask a question, now's your opportunity. You can cut the entire line. <laughs> I think we got my answer, okay. I'm faculty here, I also support us for our um, protest- Wow, he, he really- he really owned them. Congratulations. This is- <laughs> Honestly, like, Ben Shapiro's grift is at least understandable compared to Michael Knowles. Because Ben Shapiro has the appearance of having, like, a ba he, Ben Shapiro, for all of his faults, does have a basic understanding of, like, rhetoric, and he's able to present those ideas and that basic understanding in a very quick, uh, fire f manner, you know? Like, he's able to perform well under pressure in a live setting, right? Michael Knowles, on the other hand, is just, like, like, a an emotionless potato who, like, does these performative, like, uh, you have you have tape over your mouths. Uh, come come up and talk to me. Like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> All right, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. All right, we're less than thirty seconds in. We've got we've got ten to eleven minutes of this video left. What do you support specifically? Do you think that anti-immigrant rhetoric is violent free speech? Well, yes, because of the you, reasons you think that, that speech is violence. About. Uh, no, I think that that's the... what that sign said. Oh wait, uh, we need we do need to come up with a safe word, chat. Um, let's see. Uh, how about I don't know. What's what's a fun word? Smock. Smock. Smock is a fun word. Gr grussy. Pazuzu. Uh, all right. I'll, I'll I'll keep a lookout for all of your Zoomer lingo. All right. The conversation that you're having is oppressive, it, um, and so I am oppressing people by what I'm doing. So I am I am exerting violence on people by my speech. That's what the sign says, and that's what you just said. It Wait, do you, do you not do you not think that supporting a policy of like deportation encourages violence? Have you not seen how ICE deal with these people? And the racism. protester is saying that's exactly what I'm doing, and she's saying that's exactly what her sign means. So that means that you, a faculty member at an American public university, paid for by taxpayer dollars, are conflating speech with violence. Yes. Um, speech can be violent. What you are saying contributes to systemic racism in this country. It means that my students of color are pulled over and accused of stealing a car when they did not. I'm not pulling anybody over for stealing I'm any cars. I, I see many did. people of many different races in this room. I, I, they all seem to be doing just fine. I don't think I, any, any of them have felt violence because they listened to a lecture on, on basic facts about our immigration system. What, what, about the, what about the undocumented immigrants who've experienced violence as a result of you advocating for these policies? The question was, have I asked people in this room if they've felt as though some violence has been committed on them? Uh, no, I haven't asked because no violence has been committed on you. Because violence is not a subjective feeling. Violence is an objective fact. And I would say to you, as a faculty member at a taxpayer-funded university, this is the foundation of liberal education. If you cannot understand that there is a difference between speech and violence, you don't understand anything that undergirds the liberal arts or liberal education. And that is a real shame. You know, it's, <clears throat> it's kind of weird. Because if you look up basic definitions of violence, 
the damage inflicted by violence may be physical, psychological, or both. In fact, let's take a look at a different word. Stochastic. In fact, let's put it the word stochastic with uh, the word violence. Stochastic violence. Otherwise known as stochastic terrorism. Let's see. Uh, the public demonization of a person or group resulting in the incitement of a violent act, which is statistically probable, but whose specifics cannot be predicted. So, and uh, again, when you continue going around the country making speeches about how our country is being invaded, how uh, it, undocumented immigrants present a an existential threat to the United States, to Western civilization, uh, this is a call to stochastic violence. It is, uh, it is giving you the plausible deniability of saying, oh, well, I didn't tell them to go out and commit violence directly. I just... Uh, you know, was presenting ideas. Presenting ideas! You know? Yeah, I wasn't emotionally abusing my child, I was just presenting some ideas for them to consider. And I say this with all respect and with great distress for our universities. If our teachers don't under understand the difference between ideas and violence, between speech and violence, then they are in no position to educate the next generation of Americans. Like, why, child, why do you think I'm abusing you? I was just presenting you with some ideas. Grow a thicker skin, God. I was asked to give a speech in defense of George Washington at George Washington University. <laughs> George Washington, one of the greatest men who ever lived, and specifically in this case, George the Colonial, who is the mascot of GW, as well as all of those colonials who gave this world and gave all of us this great nation. I think ignorance- Wait, did he- <laughs> Oh my god. Wait. You? As well as all of those colonials who gave... Wait, wait, wait. ...case, George the Colonial, who is the mascot of GW... Wait, is he comparing the mascot of George Washington University to the actual George Washington? Yes, the mascot of this university has been as invaluable as the actual George Washington. <laughs> as well as all of those colonials who gave this world and gave all of us this great nation. I think ignorance plays a major role here in the effort to get rid of GW's colonial mascot and moniker, George himself. The activists make a number of mistakes, not merely in their logic, but even in their grasp of basic facts. <coughs> the first of which is to whom the word colonials refers. The colonials that the mascot represents were not defenders of colonialism. In fact, they were the opposite of defenders of colonialism. They fought a bloody war, they risked their lives to end colonialism in America. And to yeah, they did, but they were also colonists. You know, they were here to do colonizing. <laughs> to end rule in Great Britain. They wanted their political independence. F*** you, you f***ing fascist! Shay! 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 Imagine, imagine posting your L's <laughs> this hard. Shay! 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 Oh, there. These kids are really proving me wrong. You see, because my premise was that these students are ignorant and uh, not well behaved. But they're proving me wrong tonight. Honestly, this is, inc this is very funny to me. And I, I love this, actually. They, they called me a fascist for defending George Washington. The now, the, this is the main problem, right? The main problem here is that as much as you hate Michael Knowles, right? 
you d you should consider the optics, right? Like if he's coming there to make a speech about the uh, like how great w George Washington is, you have to understand that yeah, maybe going and protesting him is like a good idea, but like doing this in the middle of his uh, speech probably isn't going to make you look very good because he's going to be able to say, "Wow, look at all these." crazy lefties who hate George Washington. You know, that makes him look better than he really should. Hold your country, leftists. I'm for more of a mixed economy, and I am for Medicare for all. I believe... And Doesn't that seem, it seems off. It seems like you want to become an old person. Why do you want to become an old person? No, Why do you want to use old ideas like socialism? No, What? Wait, wait, wait. What? Why do you want to be old and have health care, you dumb young rube? That's giving everyone the right to health care, health insurance. And right now, our current system, we have 600,000 bankruptcies. People, people file, file for bankruptcy under our current system. Why don't you just die young and pretty like you are now, boy? Our current system is not cost effective. It costs. I agree. Uh, what was $33 trillion over a 10 year period from right now? And a recent study by the Mercatus Center actually found that the Medicare for All system in the Senate would save $2.1 trillion over a 10 year period from 2022 to 2031. So why can't you get behind that? Well, uh, when we were talking about the costs of these systems, one has to be very careful. I was promised certain costs for Obamacare, and it was there was a lot of fuzzy math because the taxes Before kicked in that. early and the benefits didn't kick in quite so early. So the the question is twofold. One, you're asking economic. Wait, Obamacare literally got millions more people health insurance. Like, you can argue that it didn't do enough, which is fine. But it literally got millions more people health insurance and the ability to go to the doctor than they would have had before. That the current healthcare regime is not efficient, and uh, therefore the socialist regime would be more efficient. That may actually be the case. That's not an argument for socialism, though. That's an argument for liberalization. Also, Obamacare was literally the Republican plan. That's for liberalizing the markets, making prices much more apparent to both the consumers and the service providers, to opening up uh, what are now virtual monopolies for health insurance companies. Uh, and, and fortunately, by the way, this administration... Wait, what does that mean? Opening up virtual monopolies for health insurance companies? That's what they had before. Where, if you're not going to get health insurance, where are you going to go? Your local health insurance provider who can out-compete? Like, health partners or, like, Blue Cross Blue Shield? Good luck. What are you, t what are you talking about? Having, having competing health care, uh, in health insurance coverage doesn't lower the price because they all know that you will pay as much as they can get you to pay because it's literally something you need in order to live around the edges worked on all of those things. There is also a moral argument as well, which is that people ought to be free, man ought to be free, and if uh, health care is going to have to be rationed, I would rather it be rationed by me and my freedom of choice than... My Michael, people, people can't be free if they can't get health care. You, you get that, right? Like... If you if you just get sick and die, are you are you free? Like if if like you get if you get like a cut and it gets infected and you can't afford to go to the doctor and then you just like lay in your apartment and die, are you are you free? And by the way, I love how he says the quiet part out loud here where he's like, "Yeah, I mean, like we just we just it's impossible for us to have enough health care, so, like, uh, I would rather make sure I have it instead of those dirty pores. Like, read, read the bottom line of his argument and understand that if you are working class, he wants you to die, okay? This rhetoric wants you to die. Conservatives, at the end of the day want you to die. If push comes to shove, they will take your death 
over raising their taxes like five dollars a year okay by some bureaucratic board somewhere in the federal government. If the United States stops leading the way in health care, you're going to see that affect global markets and, glo and global health care regimes all by, by the way, I love that they put this out in the middle of the pandemic, where the capitalist solution to the pandemic literally has people doing death boards on who gets health care. There was a there was a news story that was doing the rounds the other day about a guy who was turned away, I think for heart issues, from something like 30 hospitals because they were all too full of COVID patients, and he fucking died. There are people right now doing triage care in hospitals across the United States and making the choices about who gets and re who, who receives health care. That happens under capitalism right now and it's a matter of practicality that's not on the doctors that's on the system that has forced this upon them <sighs> around the world and it'll be a very bad thing and that is the reason that people when they actually want care living in cuba living in canada living in the united states when even their private insurance that they're forced to buy uh, doesn't cover that's why they come to the united wait People in Cuba don't come to the United States for their medical treatment. Cuba has some of the best medical treatment in the world. Literally, one of their one of their primary means of conducting diplomacy around the world is sending doctors to other countries to treat people because their doctors are so goddamn good. Like, sure, if you have the money, America's healthcare system can be useful to you. If you don't have the money, i.e. 95% of Americans, uh, sorry, you're fucked, okay? And what Michael Knowles is saying here is he would rather live in a system where 95% of the people are fucked rather than uh, having everyone be able to go to the doctor. And in fact, if everyone can go to the doctor to get preventative care and get their shit checked out, turns out... We don't need as much health care because they're getting preventative care. <sighs> the absolute lunacy. United States, because we're the leaders. We are a ration care by the size of our wallets. True. We, True. We ought to ration care no, by the size of our wallets. We already ration our care by of the size of our wallets. Of course we don't. We have a robust social safety. Wait, you just said, wait, let's, let's back this up real, real quick. Care and it was there was a lot of fuzzy math because the taxes kicked in early and the benefits didn't kick in quite so early. So the the question is twofold. One, you're asking economically, you're saying that the current healthcare regime is not efficient and uh, therefore the socialist regime would be more efficient. That may actually be the case. That's not an argument for socialism though. That's an argument for liberalization. That's for liberalizing the markets, making prices much. No, it's not more apparent to both the consumers and the service providers to opening up uh, what are now virtual monopolies. If, if the government is the sole source of uh, <clears throat> if the government is the sole source of providing health insurance to people, that means that they can collectively bargain with the health care providers to get the best price because who else are the health care providers going to negotiate with or the pharmaceutical companies when you have access to 300 million patients you have much greater bargaining power than individual health insurance companies that break up the market and that is what allows the jacking up of prices by the way monopolies for health insurance companies. Uh, and, and fortunately, by the way, this administration it has, uh, around the edges, worked on all of those things. There is also a moral argument as well, which is that people ought to be free, man ought to be free, and if uh, health care is going to have to be rationed, I would rather it be rationed by me and my free. Yeah, okay. So here, here he is. Freedom of choice. If health care is going to be rationed, I would prefer that it's rationed by me and my freedom of choice. Meanwhile, this kid goes, well, our current system rations it via wallets. And his response is, uh, uh, no. It's in the United States and hasn't in the modern era. Tens of thousands of people are dying in the U.S. 
We have a, we have a very no, care about the size of our wallets. We already ration our care. By of the course, size we of don't. Our we have a robust social safety net. We have Medicare and Medicaid. We have no. A no we we don't. It is not robust enough to provide preventative care for people, especially if you are dirt poor, if you're homeless, if you are neurodivergent, if you fall through the cracks of the means-tested system, you do not get the care you need. Like, it, this isn't rocket science, guys. Most people, by the way, who work who like have full-time minimum wage jobs a lot of them don't qualify for medicaid a lot of them don't qualify for these assistance programs and you know what that means it means they just don't go to the doctor and if they get sick they're fucked we have a very generous social safety net and nobody dies i mean it's one of the most absurd lies nobody nobody dies oh honey baby sweetie how many people die in the u.s from lack of health care um uh, let's see they found that the number of uninsured americans increased by roughly 2.3 million between 2016 and 2019 resulting in as many as 25,180 deaths before the covid 19 pandemic hit the country so literally tens of thousands of people died and that was before the massive pandemic that we find ourselves in now so you know just it doesn't affect anybody guys haha <laughs> no one dies from lack of health care of people pushing socialist health care that people are dying in the streets that's absurd anybody can walk into emergency room nobody is dying in the streets in the united states and hasn't in the modern era tens of thousands of people are dying in the u.s you can keep repeating your lie but it, it doesn't make it true show it, me the person who is denied entrance stuff. to an emergency room my friend show me the person i haven't seen them hey i'm for show, show me a person you know what the real power move there is just saying me I was denied treatment. Facts of our feelings. <laughs> well, you, you can repeat good slogans as well as bad slogans, but they remain slogans nonetheless. And I'm that. explaining to you the way the healthcare regime that. actually works. This creates ever multiplying victim groups, false victim groups like these people. This creates ever multiplying racial victims. Sec I know you're so oppressed, my dears. I know life is so hard. But by the way, the emergency medical treatment and active labor act specifies that a hospital cannot refuse a patient medical treatment if it is an emergency meaning that if it is not an emergency if it is not an emergency enough the emergency room can and does turn people away Meaning that either you just hang around the emergency room and wait for your condition to be so bad that they take you in, or you like go back and like go to sleep in your apartment and then by the time you wake up, you can't get back to the, the emergency room because you're fucking dying. For you, you have to live in the richest, most equitable, most just country in the history of the world. You have to get a college education. You have to voluntarily go to lectures. It's so awful. I can't imagine that, you know, the people, people who are in war torn nations, they must truly, they must truly pity you. Uh, goodbye. The, uh, the war torn nations that have become war torn because of the United States. By by the way, the, the if you're wondering why there are, there's so much political instability in Haiti right now, literally it's because in the in 1991 the United States uh, paid death squads to assassinate the democratically elected leader of the country, which has uh, created political instability ever since. So, you know, it's almost like we just kind of cause chaos around the world to fit our own political ends and economic ends in the united states might have something to do with why we're so wealthy you know and then we can brag about how wealthy we are and how privileged we are and uh blame other countries for um living in sewage <laughs> oh 
Oh yeah, also also uh Haiti got completely fucked by the French. The French forced them to pay like reparations for a slave rebellion. <sighs> Well, it's very difficult to use my platform when people use the heckler's veto to try to shut up any opinion that disagrees. The heckler's veto. I didn't think I was this intimidating. Wait, wait, that kid had a super soaker. Wait, okay, I, I took the vid off because I wasn't sure what was going to happen here. Well, it's very difficult to use my platform when people use the heckler's veto to try to shut up any opinion that disagrees. Damn, th those those cops really showed that kid with the super soaker. I I'm glad I'm glad our uh, police budget is going to such valiant acts of noble sacrifice, like uh, pinning this kid down with your uh, with your big police dick. I didn't think I was this intimidating. I didn't think I was this intimidating, says Michael Knowles, someone who almost got shot with a super soaker. Yes, very intimidating. I believe that gentleman just threw paint on me. I, you know, I gotta tell you, folks, I gotta tell you, I knew, I knew that this it totally- Look at, look out, guys, Michael Knowles is your badass now. The common sense statement was controversial. I didn't know it was this controversial. You're trying to teach me with your fists. Thank you. That's the same lesson that Mussolini was teaching people. Wait, the- He didn't try and punch you, dude. He tried to shoot you with the super soaker. What are you talking about? <laughs> you ridiculous fascists. You ridiculous, silly fascists. I, I would love for someone to ask him what fascism actually means. Because I am willing to- I'm willing to bet money that he has no idea what it means. Goodness gracious. How am I ever going to get the glitter paint out of my clothing? Maybe it looks good, I don't know. How is this guy still in this lecture hall? How is this guy still in this university? It is outrageous. By the way, if these people are not expelled from this university, that is a scandal for the University of Missouri. It's, it would be an absolute outrage if these people are not expelled from this university for acts of violence to protest the most common sense statement. Calls calls student who showed up with a uh, super soaker fascist, uh, and then immediately calls for every single protester at his speech to be expelled from the school. All right, sure, sure, bud. Possibly make, which is that men are not women. Imagine if I said something controversial here tonight. Imagine the reaction. Oh wait, wait, that was him. That was what he was talking about. At the, yeah, okay, fuck this guy. <laughs> nah. By the way, I love, I love that everyone immediately stopped clapping and like sat down as soon as he said that. Are not women. Oh. Uh, Imagine we, if we, I said something controversial that. here tonight. Imagine the reaction then. So my question is, um, I'm just not really sure what, what's the downside of converting our like energy system towards more like green energy, such as wind power and solar power. To me, like the idea of moving in a more uh, sustainable direction for our energy cons our production is just more about creating jobs that are, uh, produces a lack of reliance on like oil and things that are like inherently non-renewable and like foreign exports. So if you took rid of, if you got rid of just the oil industry, if you just got rid of the energy industry that the Green New Deal seeks to get rid of, you would Im immediately destroy 5.8 million jobs. Those are just- Wait, but Michael Knowles, if you, if you embraced the Green New Deal, you would create far more jobs because you need more people to build the infrastructure and then work that infrastructure to create the energy like you realize building an entirely new energy infrastructure and energy creation mechanisms and then upkeep and uh like providing uh manufacturing to 
back up that upkeep. Like, all of that would create in, like, like exponentially more jobs than the current oil industry does. Just jobs relating directly to that energy sector. Obviously, there are a zillion jobs downstream of that. And obviously, if you kill off a... Also, you can literally, I, I don't know, like, mass-produce nuclear power plants or, like, thorium reactors or, like... Uh, there are there are options out there, dude. We're making thorium reactors right now. We can we can do this. Bork Void, we got off to a rough start today, but you know what? We're we're doing better. I'll take the plan. Yeah, even even if you accepted his uh his argument at face value, which would you rather have, like uh t tens of thousands of oil jobs, or a planet to live on? It's a pretty easy decision for me to make. I would like a planet. Um, for my, for my hypothetical kids or grandkids, you know? Um, but it, it isn't even the argument that he is putting forward because literally the effort of transitioning to an entirely green and CO2, either neutral or negative grid would be, um, one of the largest human under undertakings of all time. And to argue that that is not going to create more jobs than the current oil industry does is incredibly silly to me. Uh, get, get, get good sleep, uh, Kevin. You, you have a good night. Also, hello, Hilda Beast. Can we get a shout out for Hilda Beast as well? 88% of American energy, you don't just kill off 5.8 million jobs, you kill off virtually all of the jobs. Why not convert to... Uh, again, no one's Thanos snapping the jobs away. The, by the way, this is one of my least favorite arguments that people have to rational positions, right? Like you say, well, we should do things that transition to like a better future for society or our energy grid or housing or whatever. And people say, but if you if you did if you got rid of that, then there would be nothing in in the void, and all all of society would collapse. And it's like. No, you slowly transition over time. That that's how it that's how it happens, right? And in this case, we need to do it a little bit faster because of climate change threatening all of us, but like we can do it. We we can do this. It's not un it's not insane. If you currently work in the oil fields, is it really that much of a hop and a skip to like working on uh, wind turbine manufacturing or assembly, is it really that big of a hop and a skip to like working in like a thorium reactor plant or something? Like, I, I don't think so. I think you can probably be trained into these jobs. It's just a matter of investing uh, the manpower and or, or the, the people power and the, uh, the funding. It's, it's literally it. Some hypothetical, clean, wonderful avatar energy source. Show me the energy source that could provide American energy. We Nuclear, thorium, wind, solar, tidal currents, uh, gravity batteries. We can literally do uh, so goddamn much. Like, it, it's, not, it's not an impossible situation. And the fact that he's proposing it like it is one is frankly ridiculous yeah working in an oil field sucks ass like i don't know that what what is the death rate of working in an oil field it, it, i last time i looked it was like something like one person a week or something like that yeah also hydroelectric i think i said solar but yes solar as well in fact if we get to a point in like uh energy transmission technology uh, currently, the military is experimenting with this, but we could literally put up solar panels in space to uh, collect energy from the sun and uh, use high-powered lasers to uh, send it back down to Earth. Yeah, working at natural gas fracking rigs is one of the most dangerous jobs, plus many workers are independent contractors. Yeah, they don't get any benefits. Uh, so you know what? You know what, a, you know what a great solution to that is? Democratic worker co-ops centered around the green ener energy industry. But Jack, working with nuclear is scary. I mean, like, 
I, I do think the manufacturing process for nuclear probably needs, or not probably, definitely needs, if you're going to go that route and like mine up uh, radioactive material, yeah, you need a lot closer regulations on that. Okay. Uh, which is why, by the way, thorium is a lot more promising. Uh, until we can effectively dispose of the waste, I'm not for nuclear. Uh, and the thing is, we have, there are effective ways of disposing of the waste. You can turn them into, you can uh, use high energy uh, uh, synthesis from the nuclear plant to actually uh, transmit it into diamonds. You can reuse and recycle the fuel like France does until it is, has like an extremely short half-life. Uh, you can build storage facilities. I believe Finland is doing this currently that can store like the next hundred years of nuclear waste safely in their, uh, in their bedrock. Um, there are ways you can do it. It's just that the United States has historically not really cared about doing it right. Uh, that, that is one of the biggest problems. I'll see y'all later. If there's a movie night, I can't, I just can't walk with this guy. Well, the good news is we have a minute and a half left, Razorback Bastard. Good night, Pingo. You're not showing up on the chat on screen? Wait, are you not? I, I see you on the screen, Yarg. Spectacular Snyder Man, thank you for gifting a sub to Axia Ross. Oh shit, there it went. Yeah, there's a little bit of a delay. Don't don't you worry, Yarg. Um we appreciate you here at uh anti Yarg Inc., okay? We back. We back in DD. All right, let's 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 finish this video. We're so close. You talk about how we we have reliance on foreign fuels. We found that biggest oil deposit ever in 2016. We're the we're the biggest uh, producer in the world. Uh, this is a wonderful thing. This is something that we should uh, embrace. This uh, yeah. No, our planet is dying, Michael. Idea of scarcity is is a fiction. This idea that we're just depleting our resources and they'll all be gone in 15. No, it, it's it's not a fiction. It's liter it's literally a non-renewable source of energy. This isn't like a this isn't even like difficult to understand. How how many biological organisms underground are you going to find having been turned into oil over the course of billions of years? There's a finite number of them, Michael. In years. The question you asked is what is the downside? of killing off 88% of the American economy. Outlawing, I'm, I'm uh, you asked it and well, I'm- I mean, just like long-term, why rely on, on finite resources when instead you could just have like in, uh, resources in perpetuity, you know? Relating yeah, to all the of this is lies. Of outlawing gas powered cars within 10 years, of outlawing jet fuel powered jets with it based just use electric jets use electric cars there are options who who okay chat chat i sorry i'm molding a little bit right now um who out there really loves that you have to fill up your car with gasoline and if you get into a car accident there is a chance that your car could explode is that, is that something that you find really, really important to your life? Is that, is that really that important? Or it, would you be just as happy driving a car that is uh, not releasing toxins into the atmosphere that will slowly kill us all? Uh, that is uh, not going to explode if you get into a car accident. Um, and that is generally quieter. Like who's who's like fuck yeah I get to live next to the highway I'm so I'm look I'm looking forward to all the traffic sounds. Yeah, my trans yeah the the uh, the crude the crude mechanical uh, contraption that I've strapped the uh, 
an explosion to, a constant bomb on the front of, uh, is so important to me that I won't accept any other means of transport. It's literally like, it's literally like the argument when uh, cars first started being circulated. It's like, uh, why would you drive in a car? Why would you do that, my dude? We have these perfectly good horses. I mean, sure, they shit all the time, and sure, they're living creatures with wills of their own, and they, you know, cause a lot of trouble if there's, like, you know, I don't know, a, a, a horse accident in the street. Uh, but, you know, they're just so much more reliable than these cars. Like, what are you doing? Um, nuclear, Tom Scott, yeah, I, I think we watched that already, uh, non-binary superpowers. Um, oh, Carpe Pax, I, I don't know, I, I live near a highway, I always remember the engine noises. Um, yeah, no, we already watched it, non-binary superpowers. Um, 10 horse pileup. You laugh, but that actually happened, you know? It was it was not pretty. It's not pretty when a bunch of carriages crash into each other. In 10 years of knocking down and rebuilding. Wait, noise from large roads reduce life expectancy by five to 10 years? Jeez. And re greatly re increases the risk of Alzheimer's uh, due to disturbed sleep. Damn all the buildings within 10 years. What's the downside of spending $93 trillion, 80% marginal tax rates, killing American uh, ingenuity, and then once you kill off all of the people who make all the- Wait, killing off American ingenuity? Are, are people just gonna stop inventing things, Michael? Wh why? People aren't gonna stop invent- In fact, you could make a pretty good argument that if you met people's basic needs, they'd be able to invent more things. The jobs and who uh, grow our economy. Then you just start printing money. Oh, see, Carpe Pax, I lived next to a uh, an on-ramp, so people were always accelerating. We're, we're on the same page. We're on the same page. Money. Making the global reserve currency, I don't know, like the paper in Venezuela. What's the downside of that? What's the upside of that? If you enjoyed that video- Michael Knowles, in a video where he totally owned a bunch of college kids and definitely didn't look silly and dumb the entire time.